The Murderer by Ray Bradbury. Music moved with him in the white halls. He passed an office door, the Merry Widow Waltz, another door, afternoon of a fawn, a third, kiss me again. He turned into a cross corridor. The sword dance buried him in cymbals, drums, pots, pans, knives, forks, thunder, and tin lightning. All washed away as he hurried through the anteroom where his secretary sat nicely stunned by Beethoven's fifth. He moved himself before her eyes like a hand. She didn't see him. His wrist radio buzzed. Yes? This is Lee, Dad. Don't forget about my allowance. Yes, son. I'm busy. Just didn't want you to forget, Dad, said the wrist radio. Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet swarmed about the voice and flushed into the long halls. The psychiatrist moved in the beehive of offices in the cross-pollination of themes. Stravinsky mating with Bach, Hayden unsuccessfully repulsing Rachmaninoff, Schubert slain by Duke Ellington. He nodded to the humming secretaries and the whistling doctors fresh to their morning work. At his office, he checked a few papers with his stenographer, who sang under her breath, then phoned the police captain upstairs. A few minutes later, a red light blinked. A voice said from the ceiling, Prisoner delivered to interview chamber nine. He unlocked the chamber door, stepped in, heard the door lock behind him. Go away, said the prisoner, smiling. The psychiatrist was shocked by that smile. A very sunny, pleasant, warm thing. A thing that shed bright light upon the room. Dawn among the dark hills. High noon at midnight, that smile. The blue eyes sparkled serenely above that display of self-assured dentistry. I'm here to help you, said the psychiatrist, frowning. Something was wrong with the room. He had hesitated the moment he entered. He glanced around the room. The prisoner laughed. If you're wondering why it's so quiet in here, I just kicked the radio to death. Violent, thought the doctor. The prisoner read his thought, smiled, put out a gentle hand. No, only the machines that yak, yak, yak. Bits of the walls, radios, tubes, and wires lay on the gray carpeting. Ignoring these, feeling that smile upon him like a heat lamp, the psychiatrist sat across from his patient in the unusual silence, which was like the gathering of a storm. You're Mr. Albert Brock, who calls himself the murderer? Brock nodded pleasantly. Before we start, he moved quietly and quickly to detach the wrist radio from the doctor's arm. He tucked it in his teeth like a walnut, gritted, heard it crack, handed it back to the appalled psychiatrist as if he had done them both a favor. That's better. The psychiatrist stared at the rune machine. You're running up quite a damage bill. I don't care, smiled the patient. As the old song goes, don't care what happens to me, he hummed it. The psychiatrist said, shall we start? Fine. The first victim, or one of the first, was my telephone. Murder most foul. I shoved it in the kitchen incinerator. Stopped the disposable unit in mid-swallow. Poor thing strangled to death. After that, I shot the television set. The psychiatrist said, hmm. Fired six shots right through the cathode. Made a beautiful tinkling crash like a drop chandelier. Nice imagery. Thanks, I always dreamt of being a writer. Suppose you tell me when you first began to hate the telephone. It frightened me as a child. Uncle of mine called it the ghost machine. Voices without bodies scared the living hell out of me. Later in life, I was never comfortable. Seemed like a telephone was an impersonal instrument. If it felt like it, it let your personality go through its wires. If it didn't want to, it just drained your personality away until what slipped through 
at the other end with some cold fish of a voice, all steel, copper, plastic, no warmth, no reality. It's easy to say the wrong thing on telephones. The telephone changes your meaning on you. First thing you know, you've made an enemy. Then, of course, the telephone's such a convenient thing. It just sits there and demands you call someone who doesn't want to be called. Friends were always calling, calling, calling me. I hadn't any time on my own. When it wasn't the telephone, it was the television, the radio, the phonograph. When it wasn't the television or radio or phonograph, it was motion pictures at the corner theater. Motion pictures projected with commercials on low-lying cumulus clouds. It doesn't rain rain anymore. It rains soap suds. When it wasn't high-fly cloud advertisements, it was music by Mosaic in every restaurant. Music and commercials on the buses I rode to work. When it wasn't music, it was inner office communications and my horror chamber of a radio wristwatch on which my friends and my wife owned every five minutes. What is there about such conveniences that makes them so temptingly convenient? The average man thinks, here I am, time on my hands, and there on my wrist is a wrist telephone. So why not just buzz up old Joe, eh? Hello, hello. I love my friends, my wife, humanity, very much. But when one minute my wife calls to say, where are you now, dear? And a friend calls to say, got the best off-color joke to tell you. Seems there was a guy, and a stranger calls and cries out, this is the fine facts poll. What gum are you chewing at this very instant? Well... How did you feel during the week? The fuse lit on the edge of the cliff. That same afternoon, I did what I did at the office, which was I poured a paper cup of water into the inner communications system. The psychiatrist wrote on his pad and the system shorted beautifully. The 4th of July on wheels. My God, the stenographers ran around looking lost. What an uproar. Felt better temporarily, eh? Fine. Then I got the idea at noon of stomping my wrist radio on the sidewalk. A shrill voice was just yelling out of it at me. This is the people's poll number nine. What did you eat for lunch when I kicked the wrist radio? Felt even better, eh? It grew on me. Brock rubbed his hands together. Why didn't I start a solitary revolution? Deliver man from certain conveniences. Convenient for who? I cried. Convenient for friends? Hey, Al, I thought I'd call you from the locker room out here at Green Hills. Just made a sock dulger hole in one. A hole in one, Al. A beautiful day. Having a shot of whiskey now. Thought you'd want to know, Al. Convenient for my office so when I'm in the field with my car radio, there's no moment when I'm not in touch. In touch. There's a slimy phrase. Touch hell, gripped, pawed rather, mauled and massaged and pounded by FM voices. You can't leave your car without checking in. Have you stopped to visit gas station's men's room? Okay, Brock, step on it. Brock, what took you so long? Sorry, sir. Watch it next time, Brock. Yes, sir. So do you know what I did, doctor? I bought a quart of French chocolate ice cream and spooned it into the car radio transmitter. Was there any reason, special reason, for selecting French chocolate ice cream to spoon into the broadcasting unit? Brock thought about it and smiled. It's my favorite flavor. Oh, said the doctor. I figured how. What's good enough for me is good enough for the radio transmitter. What made you think of spooning ice cream into the radio? It was a hot day. The doctor paused. And what happened next? Silence happened next. God, it was beautiful. That car radio cackling all day. Brock, go here. Brock, go there. Brock, check in. Brock, check out. Okay, Brock. Our lunch. Brock, lunch over. Brock, Brock, Brock. Well, that silence was like putting ice cream in my ears. You seem to like ice cream a lot. I just rode around feeling of the silence. It's a big bolt of the nicest, softest flannel ever made. Silence. A whole hour of it. I just sat in my car smiling, feeling of that flannel with my ears. I felt drunk with freedom. Go on. 
Then I got the idea of the portable diathermy machine. I rented one, took it on the bus going home that night. There sat all the tired commuters with their wrist radios talking to their wives saying, now I'm at 43rd, now I'm at 44th, here I am at 49th, now turning at 61st. One husband cursing, well, get out of that bar, damn it, and get home and get dinner started. I'm at 70th. And the transit system radio playing tales from the Vienna woods. A canary singing words about a first-rate wheat cereal. Then I switched on my diamethermy. Static interference. All wives cut off from husbands, grousing about a hard day at the office. All husbands cut off from wives who had just seen their children break a window. The Vienna woods chopped down. The canary mangled silence. A terrible, unexpected silence. The bus inhabitants faced with having to converse with each other. Panic. Sheer animal panic. The police seized you. The bus had to stop. After all the music was being scrambled, husbands and wives were out of touch with reality. Pandemonium, riot, and chaos. Squirrels chattering in cages. A trouble unit arrived, triangulated on me instantly, had me reprimanded, fined, and home, minus my di diathermy machine in jig time. Mr. Brock, may I suggest that so far your whole pattern here is not very practical? If you didn't like transit radios or office radios or car business radios, why didn't you join a fraternity of radio haters, start petitions, get legal and constitutional rulings. After all, this is a democracy. And I, said Brock, am that thing Bass called a minority. I did join fraternities, picket, pass petitions, take it to court. Year after year, I protested. Everyone laughed. Everyone else loved bus radios and commercials. I was out of step. Then you should have taken it like a good soldier, don't you think? The majority rules but they went too far. If a little music and keeping in touch was charming, they figured a lot would be 10 times as charming. I went wild. I got home to find my wife hysterical. Why? Because she had been completely out of touch with me for half a day. Remember, I did a dance on my wrist radio. Well, that night I laid plans to murder my house. Are you sure that's how you want me to write it down? That's semantically accurate. Kill it, dead. It's one of those talking, singing, humming, weather reporting, poetry reading, novel reciting, jingle jangling, rockabye crooning when you go to bad houses. A house that screams opera to you in the shower and teaches you Spanish in your sleep. One of those blathering caves where all kinds of electronic oracles make you feel a trifle larger than a thimble with stoves that say, I'm apricot pie and I'm done or I'm prime roast beef, so baste me, another nursery gibberish like that. With beds that rock you to sleep and shake you awake, a house that barely tolerates humans. I tell you, a front door that barks, you've mud on your feet, sir, and an electronic vacuum hound that snuffles around you from room to room, inhaling every fingernail or ash you drop. Quietly, suggested the psychiatrist. Remember that Gilbert and Sullivan song, I've got it on my list, it will never be missed. All night I listed grievances. Next morning, early, I bought a pistol. I purposely muddied my feet, stood at her front door. The front door shrilled, dirty feet, muddy feet, wipe your feet, please be neat. I shot the thing in its keyhole. I ran to the kitchen where the stove was just whistling, was just whining. Turn me over. In the middle of a mechanical omelet, I did the stove to death. Oh, how it sizzled and screamed, I'm shorted. Then the telephone rang like a spoiled brat. I shoved it down the insincorator. I must state here and now that I have nothing whatever against the insincorator. It was an innocent bystander.